the American Legion N7 LGN. N7 LGN. I can usually remember the LGN, but that's all I remember. A um, little bit of club stuff before we turn the the time over to our wonderful visitor. Um, Idaho Cube Cell Party. Is anybody excited? Yeah. When is it? I don't know. Next weekend, not this one coming, the 12th and the 13th, we as a club are setting up in Celebration Park, um, which is right off of the Snake River, south of Melba. And what road did you say brings us right in? So from Melba, just go east to Canada, go south to Victory, you'll turn west on Victory. The 12th and 13th. It starts at noon on the 12th and ends at noon on the 13th. I <laughs> Just follow Victor and you'll end up in the yeah. back end of Celebration Party. And there's a big, huge flat spot right there. You, you get off the road and you see us. Um, quite a bit of room for campers. I know we're already going to have at least three or four people camping out. Um, it counts as a protest, so everything that we've got set up before noon in the QSO party will be logging as a Parks on the Air activation. Or a visitor, I'll explain that. We as ham radio operators, lots of us like to earn certificates, pieces of paper. We like wallpaper. There's a organization that's called Parks on the Air that you get credit for activating any state or federal park or national forest or wildlife management area. Trail. Trail, and you get credit and <laughs> lots of things. But you can get credit for both being the activator and for chasing them. So there's people in this room who make contact with a POTA operator in every state in the country. So they get a work doll straights with POTA. We have people in this room maybe that I know have been trying to activate a park in every state. So it's people on the air. It started years ago with National Parks on the Air. But that's what we're going to be doing for the Idaho Cube Cell Party. Um, so the 12th and the 13th. Anybody who wants to come out, have fun, um, on the website and Facebook page is a link to Sign Up Genius. So if you want to guarantee that you have a slot to operate a radio, please sign up. What? Please. Please. I, I will try to put you on a radio if you're not signed up. But if we have 10 people who show up and want to work from, say, 2 to 4 o'clock in the afternoon and we've only got three radios, I can't put 10 people on the air. But there will be times that everybody can get on the air. Um, the next meeting, next month. I think that's all we've got coming up. Is that right? Okay, is that based on county then? I don't. Idaho Cube Party is by county. So for anybody who is not aware, Idaho Cube Cell Party is a contest. Um, as an in-state operator, our goal is to contact every state in the country as well as all Canadian provinces and all countries. That's our multipliers. Well, I think you can walk across the river. So yes. Yes. And we've been talking about that, maybe setting up a portable station over there who's battery powered. And then for those stations who are outside of Idaho, this is why he's bringing up the county, their multiplier is every county. So if they're able to contact every county in Idaho, that means 44 multipliers. So whatever number of contacts they have, they multiply by 44 to get their score. So un unusual counties are um, searched hard, as well as people who are trying to get just work all counties awards through ARRL and everybody else. They want to get these strange counties as well as Sometimes more interesting grid squares. Um, trying to think of any other business. I, business. All right. I want to keep my part as short as possible. Yes. Go on now, and I got your caps. <laughs> There's Alan. Oh, so thank you. Um, if anybody. Can use these. 
We have a gentleman who's brought in a lot of these little plastic containers. They work great for small parts to organize, as well as some medicine bottles. Those are all free for anybody who would like them. Please take as many home as you would like. I would love to not have to find some place to put any of them when we're done. Um, all right, it's off. Come on up here. So, for those of you who don't know, what's your title at American Legion? The activity planner. Bob is the activity planner for the American Legion Club based at Meridian. Um, he is the person who um, put this together for us. So, thank you, Bob. Thanks. And, and, and uh, thanks, all you guys, for. Coming out, I think it's a great thing that all of us get together and share the information. We know a lot, and we have a lot of problems, so the more people that should be able to share and put things together and have some fun doing it, uh, that's what it's all about. I want to thank the uh, Bob staff for putting out a nice dinner for us all tonight. Where are they? When, when, when they come back in, yeah, we need to try to make her face turn red. It's a really good yeah. turnout for everybody in there, too. Um, <laughs> probably just about a year ago, um, was still in the tech at the time, and was thinking, how did Red Chess to be a next to be there? How do I do this? So that those kind of thoughts do go over something called uh, cycle. Cycle 25. And I can remember when I first moved to Idaho 35 years ago. Um, I sat at a dinner with a German couple who were solar physicists. And I just remember thinking, like, so interesting. I mean, growing up, if you're old enough, uh, or we're young enough, we, we were told the, the moon was made of cheese. And but they talked about this plasma uh, model that they were uh, recognizing for the sun. And I don't know if that's changed, but um, I just thought that was interesting. Well, with how we use uh, the solar wind and solar radiation in our hobby, I thought it'd be interesting to find someone who could talk to us about what the sun is. Well, what is that? What about that origin? What about that origin place that allows us to do DX? Those kind of horrible things. So I have, and was found, I found the, I called the Boise Astronomical Society and got a hold of Brian. Brian Jackson. And he says, that sounds like a lot of fun. Let me think about it. So a couple months later he goes, I found a guy that I think would be great. And so we talked to him and agreed to come out. This is uh, Dr. Carl Schmidt. He's a planetary scientist from Boston University uh, the cent at the Center for Space Physics. Uh, he's, mar he's married, has wife Rachel and uh, daughter Wendy. Rachel is a professor of music at Berkeley Music School in Boston. Um, he did his undergraduate work in Colorado and his PhD at Boston University, where he can take where he right now uh, resides and works. So I uh, just appreciate you coming out here and talk to us tonight. And I'll uh, turn it over to you. Thanks, Tess. <laughs> Thanks, you know me well. Um, it's really humbling to see so many white people sharing their knowledge about really technically challenging things and working together. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. So thanks. Uh, this is maybe not the sun that you would recognize. This is the, the sun uh, X ray wavelengths, uh, solar dynamic observatory. And the sun sure looks angrier at, uh, at these wavelengths, a lot more scared of that sun than I am of the one that I recognize the visible wavelengths. Um, when you think about it, the sun is pretty terrifying. It's certainly one of the things that a lot of astronauts report back when they go into space that left a big impression on them of just how fragile we are in comparison to that. So let's, let's get into it. 
Um, that image comes from this solar dynamics observatory. We have a couple of uh, orbital observatories. Japan has orbital observatories uh, that are uh, completely dedicated to, to the study of the sun. It wasn't until the mid 19th century that we had a very good sense of uh, how big the sun was, how far away it was. And up until the 20th century, no one could even explain what was the source of the energy in the sun. It's not all that long ago. So what is that source? Is it on fire? Not on fire. We took the, the whole chemical energy content of the sun, divided it by how much power it's outputting per unit time. That's only about 10,000 years. Um, so not on fire, but fire is technically stored somewhere. I'm not going to show it aside, but I really recommend this video of Richard Fire and describing uh, why, what exactly fire is in the chemical reaction. It was kind of interesting the way it's stored somewhere. Um, maybe it's a conversion of gravitational potential energy, right? It's, it's big. If it's contracting, that's a lot of energy. If you divide the gravitational potential by luminosity, that's 25 million years. And uh, this seems like a pretty reasonable theory for, for a little while until they started finding fossils of dinosaurs that were geologists And, you know, a caveat that the um, the Earth is probably older than us. <laughs> so it wasn't until 1905 that uh, a new option came about. Uh, nuclear potential energy. We finally understood that um, uh, there was energy in mass. It's job, Einstein. Um, but then the question arose of like, well, if it's fusion now, and I, I see you keep pointing over, over here to that. Is it because I should talk this direction? Oh! Make their faces turn red. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for being such a kind host. Thank you, Tom. Now, uh, nuclear fusion requires high temperatures, high densities. I mean, we, we can do something with nuclear energy here on Earth, but it's not fusion. These are conditions that are only found deep in sense core. They have not been replicated in any laboratory on Earth. Um, the question is, how did the sun become hot enough to start all of this in the first place? That did happen through gravitational contraction. It the gravitational potential energy raised the interior temperature and pressure until it became hot enough for nuclear fusion to occur. So we have this sort of stable equilibrium now where it's keeping its size and its energy uh, pretty much constant through that balance of outward push of gas pressure because they're hot and the inward pull of the sun's gravity. So it's not getting any bigger or smaller. And the weight of the upper layers is compressing. So it's just like our atmosphere, dense air down here with high air up in the F region where that's the radiators. The energy balance works much the same. It radiates um, this energy back out into space, and that's another sort of conservation law where that's not being created for the sort of the process just to be distributed. So we're compressing these atmosphere layers on the sun. We can call it the sun atmosphere, just like Earth has an atmosphere. It's weighing down the bottom layers, and that poor guy on the bottom is where nuclear fusion is happening. Gravitational equilibrium is what's pushing it downwards, and um, the energy that that fusion, which is outward, is what's balancing it. The rate at which the energy it radiates from the surface must be the same as what it is in the core, right? You can't gain or lose energy anywhere along the way. And so it's that gravitational 
contraction that provided the energy to, um, to start fusion, but once fusion started, that provided the effect for us when the sun has been the same ever since. So in terms of its structure, let's start outward and, and sort of move on down in. Um, the gas is a, a giant ball of hot gas, and when gas is hot enough, it gets ionized. You can bounce radio waves from ionized material. An ionized gas is called a plasma. Different temperatures and densities of plasma at different depths are what give up these layers of structure. Um, the rotation of the sun, it's not a rigid rotating body like the Earth, it rotates faster than poles than it does at the equator. And that sort of fits itself all not. Um, so it, it tangles itself up as it rotates, and that entangling is what gives rest to the solar cycles. And uh, we call it sol solar cycle 25 that's coming up, um, but they they uh, they only started counting you know solar cycle 25 ago, so that's kind of an arbitrary definition. Now, there is a pretty cool mission studying the sun right now called the Parker Solar Probe. It's after this guy, Eugene Parker. I invited him to give a talk in Boston once. He's still alive. It's the only mission that NASA has named after a living person. Um, and he sort of garnered that fame by um, coming up with a model for the solar winds coming away from the sun, how it became supersonic. That was not understood before Eugene Parker's theories in the 1950s. Uh, it's a unique mission in that it will get closer to the sun than any spacecraft has ever been. And it will try and go inside of this sonic pump. It has already, but this team has collected so much data that they haven't gotten to that interesting stuff. It's still digesting what had come. These are some images from Parker Solar Probe. The so-called solar wind is this stuff here. And this is uh, pointing outward as a stream of electrons. So this is plasma. And scattering white sunlight off of those electrons at right angles. And some of them fall off into the telescope on board this orbiter. And it's a time series. So they've taken a few different pictures and subtracted one from another. So this is a moving planet within uh, within that time series. You can see it's sort of soft self subtract up there. A laser pointer something about and it detects some crazy comets. Sounds big enough that it pulls lots of comets into the air solar system with a higher density of comets there. And it gets close to the sun by giving a little kick when it goes around Venus to get a gravitational assist to get the angular momentum to make it that close to the sun. So the solar wind, when we use this word wind, it's not neutral gas wind like we have here in the Earth's atmosphere. It's a wind of plasma. Its density here is about five particles per cubic centimeter that there is really rarefied. Uh, but it's moving really fast. It's moving a couple hundred kilometers per second. It gets up to a thousand kilometers per second. And you can think of the solar wind as a form of space weather. It's constantly changing. Uh, and it's just continually blown outward in all directions from the sun. It helps shape uh, this thing that we call the magnetosphere. I'll use that term. It doesn't mean that we have a magnetic field that's spherical. It's kind of a misnomer. But it's just the word that we use for Earth's magnetic field. And it's very much shaped by the pressure of the solar winds into a teardrop shape. The solar corona um, is the layer interior of that, that solar wind. Um, it's low density gas. It's the outermost uh, layer of the solar atmosphere. It extends for a few million kilometers above the sun's visible surface. And it's got a temperature of about a million degrees or so. 
that's pretty hot. So it's going to emit X-rays. Those X-rays are going to impact your upper atmosphere and create layers of ionization in the atmosphere, which matter for you all. Um, the solar corona, because of that temperature, is fully ionized flat. We keep on marching down, we get colder, right? You would think that you would just get hotter and hotter as you get closer to the sun. But there are temperature conversion layers in the sun's atmosphere. So it changes. Uh, this radiates most of the ultraviolet light, and it's that ultraviolet light that ionizes the F region where most of the radio bouncing is, is happening. Um, that, uh, that ultraviolet light is pretty highly variable as um, correlated with the solar cycles. But we'll have more ionization during solar maximum, less ionization during solar minimum. So that's going to supply our F region ionosphere here on Earth. Let's take a look at how messy this spectrum is during the love hand waving, and this will sort of justify why I need to do that. We have to look at spaghetti plots like this to understand the sun. And um, if you, well, it's kind of hard to, to, to squint and see, but some of these things that are generating these spectral emission lines are like 20 times ionized iron and really exotic um, chemical makeup. But, uh, you know, normally we think about things being singly ionized oxygen here on Earth, or maybe singly ionized molecular oxygen. But this is where you strip 20 electrons from an atom because it's so hot. And this one, bright emission lines. You have different emission lines in different regions of the sun and a different spectrum in different regions. You can talk about the sort of quiescent calm solar corona, the corona above a coronal hole, because gaps in the corona. Um, to have an active corona above an active region on the sun. And an active region is different from a solar flare. And an uh, also plot of here is just the average of the sun's disk if you're looking right at the center and just integrated all that. But it comes down a little bit when you start getting into the, the middle ultraviolet. Um, but there's, there's, there's a lot to take on here, and that's why we haven't really figured out all of what there is to study about sun is because it's a lot of spaghetti blasts like this for physicists to, to drum up what they can. Now, when we look at the sun, we see a layer called the photosphere. Um, and that's kind of what we consider the lowest layer of the atmosphere. It's relatively cold, 6,000 degrees Kelvin. I say relative because we're talking about solar temperatures now. Um, the gas there is less dense than the Earth's atmosphere, but it's much hotter. Um, and you know, physically, it kind of looks like a pot of boiling water. And this is the, the layer which we see on the box. We keep marching down towards the core. We've got convection zone beneath that. Um, that's what's generating all that uh, sort of what looks like boiling water on the surface of the sun. That energy is transported by rising hot gas and cooling gas. So it's a convective process. Boiling water, the cool stuff falls back down into the sun. The hot stuff boils down. And then the radiation zone beneath that is not terribly the way on that convective layer that is. It's just a straight radial motion outward, and um, the energy from the core is just being carried away in a straight line. And now our temperature is starting to get pretty hot again, we're up to 10 million degrees Kelvin. And finally, after all of those layers, we get to the core. And that's where the nuclear fusion is happening. It's 15 million degrees Kelvin. Density is about 100 times that of water, which is a lot. But not nearly as dense as you would think. Um, the pressure, however, is the sort of, kind of immense astronomical numbers, 200 billion times the pressure in this room. So I, I want to distinguish between nuclear energy, which uses vision, where we're taking um, big radioactive things, breaking them into small uh, 
atomic nuclei and fusion, which is what's going on in the sun. Uh, now we're taking two small nuclei and merging them together to pick a bigger one. And at the smallest nuclei that they could be, um, this is the simplest atoms. Hydrogen is getting fused into helium. So in the core, that, um, that plasma has particles that are traveling towards one another with really, really high energy, high velocity. And so it makes the particles get pretty close together with, uh, with those kind of pressures. And um, they undergo collisions, and they can react with one another. And it's the reaction between those atomic nuclei that, that sort of makes, makes all this go down. Set through. Uh, when we think about atomic nuclei, these are charged particles, right? These are um, these are protons, and we all know opposites attract. Like particles should push each other away. Well, they do. And there's this normal cobaltic repulsive force to positive particles that want to get away from each other. But if you can get them over that cobaltic barrier, over that hump, they start to snap and react with one another. And we can't do that here on Earth because we can't get those particles still together. But we can in the center of the sun. And that's what's taking four protons and building helium. Now, that was, that's the hand wavy picture. The detailed picture involves subatomic particles and Einstein's Sensi square. So you take two protons and you smack them together over that columbic barrier. And they're going to send off some subatomic particles when they combine. One of those protons is going to become a neutron, so it's no longer charged. That's going to emit a positron and a neutrino. Positrons don't last very long. They're going to bump into an electron and annihilate. Uh, the neutrinos are going to blast their way all the way through the sun right away. And they're very hard to detect because they don't get stopped by matter. They don't react with matter easily, and they're massless. Now we've got our proton and neutron, our proton and neutron. So it's, it's just a neutral hydrogen and uh, nuclear uh, with one neutron atom. Um, so we call it deuterium, it's heavy hydrogen. We apply that with another proton that gives off a gamma ray, the, the highest energy of light that you can have in the electromagnetic spectrum. And now we've got two of those things. If we collide those together, those two helium three nuclei use a helium four, just about two protons, and we've built, we've done, we've built uh, a helium nu nucleus, and we've given out some subatomic particles. If we take an inventory of what went in, it's four protons, inventory of what went out, a helium nucleus plus two gamma rays two positrons, two neutrinos. The total mass is just under 1% lower than what went in. It's not like we're taking all of that mass of the sun and then E equals mc squared energy. It's the best fraction of 1%. And that's all that it takes. E lose a lot of energy and a little bit of mass. Okay. So, I will kind of try and pose questions to you all because I've, I've got door prizes to time to speak up. Now, we've got this sort of terrifying process of nuclear fusion happening right in our solar system neighborhood. What keeps it from going, going crazy on us? Uh, what would happen if we change the core temperature of the sun? Would the core expand and heat up? Would the core expand and cool? Would the core blow up like a hydrogen bomb? Should have focused on the last one. There you go. A couple of these things. 
that whoever heard the answer over here or was back there? Back here. So Paul's the one that it's etched in with a with a laser. <laughs> so you know, this is just one of the many self-regulating processes that keep us all alive. We didn't have this sort of thermos that we could have a runaway zone, uh, just like we could have runaway global warming if we move a self-regulating process too far away. So if the if the if there's a drop in core temperature, then um, that's going to lower the pressure. You're going to contract. But when you contract, then you're pushing those things close together, so it heats up, re-expands, and just doing stuff one way. On the other hand, if you raise the core temperatures, then you're going to expand it. Expanded gas gets cold, and it contracts again, so it keeps the sun where it's supposed to be. So we're making energy in the core. It needs to get out. Um, it doesn't just travel out. Right? If you look at the sun, you can't see through it. So the photon, particle of light that you're looking at, needed to get stuck in the sun somewhere. It takes hundreds of thousands of years for those photons to get from the core to the level that we're, we can see them. So the really old, we're seeing the sun's energy as it was created a long time ago. Um, you can think of this as Brownian motion. Uh, it's the term for it. And there's a good analogy. You know, we use like charcoal for filters. Even really, like charcoal is a good filter. Is you imagine getting in your car and just taking left and right turns randomly, like you were bumping into something. You hardly get anywhere because you always get stuck in cities. You never get on the highway and get off. And the motion of particles inside of this thing where they're sliding in random directions works a lot like taking random left and right turns. You don't actually get anywhere very quickly, so you have to make it through this huge gradient that is the size of the sun around average, you're moving upwards, but a lot of times they'll just move back down towards it. So it takes a while, and there are many, many collisions. We define this surface of the sun called the photosphere at the tau equals one level. Meaning, on average, that photon had one collision before we saw it last. Um, there's, there's this thing called opacity, and the photons slide many times to have a tau of 10, 100, 1,000 million billions. So, this supposed to be a region is shown here on the top, and if you didn't have the glare of the sun, this is how it would look to your eye, with this optical wavelength. And you just see this boiling convective pattern. These bright blobs show where the hot gas is rising up, and the dark regions sort of fill in between those convective cells or where the gas is falling back down. That's finally releasing this energy that was created hundreds of thousands of years ago. We only have a couple of ways to prove all of what I've just said about the solar interior. We can make mathematical models. We can observe solar vibrations. We can observe solar neutrinos. So we can use Doppler, Doppler, Doppler imaging as, as one technique. This is called helio seismology. If you just look at how the sun is vibrating, um, it has structure to it the same way vibrating guitar has structure to it. So this is just uh, a guitar after you plug a string, stepping through uh, frequency, looking at all of those harmonics resonating against a guitar. And when you get to the higher and higher frequencies, there's more multiples because the wavelengths are shorter. You can scan through the sun in Doppler space as well. So this is sunspot scanning through frequency just the same and we can see that pattern uh, and the size scale of that pattern teaches us something about the interior in complicated ways that I can only sort of wait my hands. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll do that here and just say there is a whole uh, theory that comes from those vibrations and it agrees with the data. 
but I'm excited because I can. Uh, the nuclear fusion predicts neutrinos, right? So if we can observe these neutrinos, we have a direct eye instant corner of the sun, right? They don't get stuck all the way out the way light does. So observing these neutrinos has been a big thing in physics in the latter half of the 20th century. And all of those experiments that happened um, in deep, deep mine shafts, because you want to beat down all of the background noise. And neutrinos don't really interact much with mass. Um, and so they go right through, and you will get a higher neutrino signal relative to the background noise deep in a cave than you will on the surface of the Earth. So they have built these, these crazy things. There's, there's one in North Dakota, it's the Super Kamio Kande experiment in Japan, and try to observe neutrinos. And the first thing that they learned was there was only a third as many as there was supposed to be. They counted the wrong number. And it took them a while to understand how, but it was that some of the neutrinos have changed form as this thing called spin of a subatomic particle and the spin that flipped. And that changed how those neutrinos interacted with matters, with matter. And so that's another hand way sort of statement, but um, the correct explanation for those missing two thirds of the neutrinos that were predicted um, only came about in the 1990s and it was awarded a Nobel Prize. So we don't count very many of these things, right? You need these big bathtubs full of water, and you're, and you're trying to detect changes in that water in a bathtub in a deep, deep mine shaft. And if you take 500 days of data on solar neutrinos and try to make an image of where those things came from, that's what an image of the core of the sun looks like. If you take days of neutrino imaging instead of normal imaging of photons and light. And so it's just kind of cool we can take a picture of the core of the sun, even if it's a crime picture. So solar activity is a lot like weather. There's sunspots, solar flares, there's solar prominences. All of these things have magnetic origins. Um, they're all interrelated. The fields on the surface of the sun, they change really easily and, and they form and reform and restructure themselves because they're in this turbulent convective layer on the surface. And it's just kind of a, a busy place for us moving around. Um, this is from a ground based solar telescope. You need to be careful, solar telescopes, um, to keep them cool because uh, it's really easy to buy things when you find a telescope at the sun. It's usually done with an off-axis mirror, so the students and stuff are not in front of the, the mirror, they're off to the side. And that's, that's how this one works. Um, the sunspots, even though they're the active regions, even though that they're the angry brothers, are colder. So they appear dark, they appear black. We're observing the, the sun as the color yellow, just like a hot stove is red, it's thermal yellow. It's, it's the color yellow because it's that temperature. So when we see it as a darker color, it's colder. Um, these are just regions with strong magnetic fields, and they're, and they're big. The sun's body, you know, it's a little spot is still the size of the Earth. That magnetic structure moves on, on pretty quick time scales. You can see the clock ticking away in, in minutes over there. So these are really dynamic regions. And that magnetic field that's within that sunspot is kind of restructuring itself quickly. These magnetic fields have pressure and magnetic pressure. And that pressure is pushing aside all of those hot convective cells around it. So it's just making room for itself in the surface itself. Now, how do we know that, right? I can just say stuff like that, but how do we really know? Um, there's spectroscopy in, in the field of astronomy, 
where you take a spectrograph slip and then you disperse the light like you would in a prism. And if there's gas in the solar atmosphere, that gas will absorb a certain transition within a molecule or atom and give you a spectral line. So you see a dark spectral line when you take a spectrum. And if you put that spectral line across a sunspot, which that's, that's the spectral line up and down, and this is the sunspot. Uh, just sort of three of them clustered together. You see that that line splits into three, right? So, so that's weird. It's it's an effect it's called the Zeeman effect, where you've uh, detuned the the energy levels within an atom using a magnetic field, and by detuning, you separate them into multiple smaller hyperfine structured transitions to get multiple absorption lines. That tells you there's a really high magnetic field that is detuning the energy levels in those atoms. The pressure that I, I'm calling magnetic pressure, there's sort of a convention of how we represent magnetic fields. We draw magnetic field lines, and when those lines are close together, you have a stronger magnetic field. But an important thing um, on Earth or on the sun is that Plasma is along those magnetic fields. That's particles gyrating like this. Ions and electrons, ions gyrate one way, the electrons gyrate another way. If ions have big gyro motion, the electrons. And all of that plasma creates its own pressure. That pressure is what's pushing and making an opening for some spots on the surface of the sun. Um, so this is also like you know, there's no such thing as a magnetic monopole. There's just gravity that's that all goes to one point, but magnets only have dipoles. The magnetic field line is the path that a magnetic monopole would orbit another magnet if there were monopoles. That just confuses the one. Uh, so, anyhow, there's these things called magnetic fields. And magnetic field lines that we can draw cartoons of that are coming up from the sun's photosphere and then going back into the sun's photosphere that have plasma traps along them. And for this reason, sunspots usually come in pairs. It's, it's a field coming up from the surface of the sun going back down into the surface. That's a tangled up field line that is in the surface of the sun. Um, they, uh, appear in lots of different wavelengths. So when we think about solar activity and things that will change uh, space weather conditions on Earth, we're often talking about this sort of stuff. Now, sunspot behavior has this periodic cycle to it. And this is a plot of the number of sunspots um, that uh, are counted per sun unit time over the last 20 years. And, um, you can think that we could do this very accurately, but the records, even going back to the 1500s, on the number of sunspots are really active. Um, so this is a pretty reliable thing we've been doing for, for a long time. And it goes up and down with this 11-year cycle. And we have sunspots a lot every 11 years, and then not. Uh, there's this alternating pattern that it needs an explanation. Um, even more so, the location on the sun is odd. Uh, they start out uh, at the equator, and then they move to, to higher and higher latitudes as the solar cycle progresses. So the location of sunspot and solar latitude shifts over time. So we call this the butterfly diagram because it looks like a butterfly. And the working explanation is this. Remember I said that the sun doesn't spin like a rigid body. It spins faster at the poles than it does at the equator. And that wraps up its magnetic field lines. So if there's sunspots on those field lines, they will drift upwards of latitude over time. 
That's the explanation for the butterfly diagram. And this sort of gives us a, a, a clue as to what's going on. And so the, then the question is, well, why the 11 year solar cycle? And the working theory for that, and it's just a theory, it's not proven, is that the magnetic pole of the sun flips for the period of 22 years. So it'll go from north south to south north and back every 22 years. That's two flips per period, right? So when it flips, that magnetic field line gets all tangled up around itself with a period of 11 years. And we think that's what's, what's going on. Those loops of gas um, that connect sunspots often have this thing called a prominence, which is plasma that's trapped in that magnetic field line coming out of the surface of the sun and coming back into it. The prominences are large structures. That's the earth to scale. And um, these are the, the scarier things that happen on the sun. So. If I um, step through wavelength on the bottom right picture from visible wavelengths to x-rays, you can see the sun's just a lot more active in x-rays. There's all these localized regions where it's hot. Each one of those congregates around sunspots and around these prominences, this plasma that's connecting the magnetic field between sunspots above the surface of the sun. And from that video of sunspots a minute ago, you know that they change on a time scale of minutes. Right? We're just reconfiguring that magnetic field quickly. Well, there's tension along those magnetic fields, just like tension on a string that you're pulling on. And they can snap. They can reconnect and redistribute the magnetic field elsewhere. When they snap, when they suddenly change, uh, that releases energy in the form of X-rays, the, the one of the higher energies of light that can come from the sun. And these X-rays will ionize deeper levels of uh, the the ionosphere here on the Earth. So when you have an X-ray flare, that's when you're going to be able to pick up a different radio uh, broadcaster that you normally get because it's a different layer. It's not ultraviolet light anymore, that's actually light. So this is uh, uh, the, the sun and x-ray wavelengths, and this layer above the sun is the thermosphere from the, it's much hotter than the, the photosphere that we usually look at. Photosphere is 67 degrees, we're talking about a million degrees, or maybe even 10 million degrees here. So even though you're above the sun, you're hotter than you are at the surface. So the atmosphere is hotter than the sun. And there are holes through the corona. Like you can, you can see that dark region on the top. There just is no corona in certain places. The solar spectrum looks different there. The solar wind is getting accelerated differently there. There's, there's a lot going on. Now, when these prominences break, they release a certain light. They also release um, mass, the plasma that is on those magnetic field lines. If that magnetic field snaps and travels away from the sun, the tension is pulling away from the sun. It takes all of that plasma on it and shoots it off into space. It's called a coronal mass ejection. And this is what drives aurora here on Earth. So this is a coronal mass ejection seen from Hanoi. Uh, you can see that magnetic field line breaking. That's the sun to scale in the white circle. This is called a grass grass, blotted out. You can see that material leaving. It's very high above the sun, and it's still the loop structure. When that uh, material is released, you can see at a great distance using these chronographic techniques to just mask out the sun and look at this really extended plasma uh, atmosphere above it. And this is just white light. This is this is light that we can see. It's just pretty rarefied, pretty faint in a telescope. Um, so this is with the stereo A and B imagers. These are traveling around in Earth's orbit. This is looking down over the solar system. These are shockwaves of coronal mass ejections that are uh, uh, in 
impact on the Earth, impact on the spacecraft, impact on the planets. And this is a video of how they impact the Earth's magnetic field. So that solar winds coming from coronal mass ejections, it gets more intense, it changes the shape of the Earth's magnetic field. And the Earth goes from having this really elongated tail structure to becoming more dipolar, where the tail start to form these blobs of magnetic field called plasmoids that sit at the back. And that's magnetic flux leaving the Earth. That's plasma around the Earth's um, plasma sphere, magnetosphere, getting torn off by a coronal mass ejection from the sun. And meanwhile, these magnetic field lines that are in the magnetotail are coming backwards. This is just viewing that from top down and stuff from the side. So that big blob that travels away there, um, uh, where we're, we're losing chunks, those are, those are the, the last one of things. Question? So with uh, these coronal mass ejected, that mass actually ejected from the sun. Yeah. How does it regain its mass? Uh, well, it's got plenty, you know. <laughs> <laughs> It's gone. It's gone. Yeah. It doesn't even function anymore. It doesn't. It's just gone. Um, yeah, great question. Um, now, that sort of solar wind uh, mass and the, the increased mass of coronal mass ejections form this whole structure of Earth's magnetosphere. This is sort of continuing on with that structure. At the, the nose, where this wind is coming, there are all these ripples. And that's because we have a sphere where the stagnant flow, magnetosphere, fast flow coming from the sun. And it's just like a, a bow of, of a boat, you get a bow shot around the earth. So the waves fall up and down the whole space around that bow shot. So there's there's a lot there's a lot happening here, all from chronal mass ejections. It was a great question. Thank you for giving me all my stories. He gets it. He gets it too. <laughs> yeah, we got one. It's good for the second one. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you might be wondering what all these stripes are up top there. Those are those are planets. They're just so bright that um, it saturates the row of pixels in the detector. They move real slowly, these plants move real slowly. This is um, this cool mission called Stereo. We send a spacecraft in Earth's orbit, the head of the Earth, and behind the Earth to look with stereo vision at what is between us and the sun. So they're both looking in between us and the sun. And when you map that stereo projection, you can figure out the directionality of things. Is it in the foreground? Is it in the background? Or is it along that line of sight where it's from the sun material coming at us and we need to get ready for a geomagnetic storm. So this interaction with Earth's magnetosphere of streaming particles and solar wind is uh, what shapes uh, what shapes the way the plasma precipitates down through the magnetosphere and impacts as aurora. But recognize um, that deep colored green from oxygen transitions in Earth's upper atmosphere. Um, we often read that that is material that comes from a coronal mass ejection, it comes from the sun, and precipitates down through uh, Earth's magnetosphere. And that's actually a little bit wrong. Uh, textbooks get this wrong a lot. So the reason I like this movie is because it gets right in that that is actually just changing the shape of Earth's magnetosphere as the plasma that is Earth's plasma. This is Earth's material, it's trapped in Earth's magnetic field that is getting thrown back into Earth's upper atmosphere. So it's not material from the sun, it's material from the Earth that is diverted by the magnetic field. Is there any way to project the Boreals to the Earth? Sure, yeah. Um, it's a coronal mass ejection. It's when we drive uh, a stronger pressure on that magnetosphere. It will compress just the way it, it did in the, 
the video here where it changes the shape of the tail. And the plasma that is in Earth's magneto tail um, down, down with the Earth gets pulled back towards the Earth when that forms a more that color shape. So you see the magneto tail is really stretched out there. There's plasma along that. And that plasma is perfectly comfortable far away from the Earth until we compress that magnetic field line, it becomes more of this slope shape, and it gets drawn back in towards the Earth when it's it back. Yeah. It's, it's magnetic tension. It's, it's magnetic fields are like rubber bands, and it just wants to get to its most comfortable place to set the expression out. And what's the same on this and you project wind from the sun. Yeah, yeah, and, and effects can do it pretty well because uh, we have a couple of spacecrafts that tell you longitude in the solar system, like in the inner solar system. You know, Mission Stereo is one of them. There's our solar probe around the, the Venus sun orbit. And so we've got a couple of points that tell us if a coronal mass ejection or shock wave um, uh, is coming towards the Earth, and they move slowly. They move at around 400 kilometers per second. It's not really fast, but it's slower than the speed of light, right? So it's not like a solar flare where you see an event on the sun as it happens. You see a solar flare, and then you wait 18 hours or so for all of that mass to finally catch up to. So it's like hearing um, thunder after you see lightning. So we do have pretty good predictors. They're not, you know, weeks out, but they're, they're a day before. So, like the carrying pin event, which was a C of E that made a major E of B on the Earth, how does that relate to this? Is it just a really strong I don't know the field? So E of B. Right, so like we've had during the, I don't know what the year was, the carrying pin event, it caused enough of the magnetic disturbance on the Earth that we lost uh, power grid, we lose total communications at times. You know, they, they, they theorize that if we have another event like the Carrington or Stronger, which happens every X every year, we could lose every satellite in orbit. Yeah. So, yes, this, this phenomenon is what does that. I'm, I'm always a little bit hesitant before I try and get people on the panic train of. You lose everything in the next, you know, big solar event. There's so many people that specialize in like space weather fear mongering, and <laughs> there's big money in it, and it's just all bullshit. Well, I'm just curious as to what part of this causes those issues on the Earth. Is it just that the magnetic field compresses and expands so much when that CME hits it that it's causing? That's exactly that. So when, when you change a magnetic field. Uh, if, if, uh, if you ever had a, uh, sometimes in high school they, 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 they teach uh, Maxwell's equations because it's, you have a change in the magnetic field that corresponds to an electric field. That electric field will then send particles one way or another and then take things that are normally in the ionosphere, send them down into power grids. And power grids can act like big antennas where there's when there's electric field across them, it drives a lot of current through them, and it'll you know, blow up the telephone pole. The last event where that really happened is a long time ago, and it's, it's kind of yeah. We've got this mass from the sun coming in a gravitational field. Does it affect the Earth at all, or does the gravitational field absorb all that energy? Gravity's not that important, because the, the, it's, it's electromagnetics, and if you if you've read um, uh, um, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you know, you know this magic number forty two. Forty two is um, an exponent of how much stronger the electromagnetic forces are above. They, they both scale scales one over our square, right? um, and the gravitational forces on particles that are feeling magnetic fields and electric fields are almost always negligible. So it doesn't really interact with the air spring. It's just the air spring. 
because our magnetic field is forty percent, and it's going around the earth. Yeah, yeah kind of. It's it's more that it's it's shaping what Earth had to begin with, and we're spinning in itself. But yeah. Yeah. It's the same ionization that uh, you're bouncing uh, radio or That is plasma. Some of that can leave. And it's, it's really expensive. The, the F region goes up hundreds and hundreds of kilometers. At that point, the particles don't collide with one another anymore. They're so rare, they don't have anything to bounce into. Is it just the core uh, of our planet that it's created some cosmic field of Yeah, exactly. Or is it the Earth passing through the, like, the, uh, the field that's generated by the sun? It's the first. It's the first. So the, the Earth has its own, uh, they call it a dynamo, where there's uh, um, uh, conductive. Yeah, there's any any time you have uh, uh, a material that can conduct, where electrons can flow freely like metal, and it's moving, that can generate a and the earth has that connect for the sun. Pretty much, there's a lot of. <laughs> so that precipitating plasma creates aurora. Sometimes um, the aurora oval can move greater, right? When you make that magnetic field more dipole, it's not stretched out into a big long tail, it's um, more relaxed. Uh, the field lines where this plasma is precipitating down um, will come right over our heads here. Uh, and the auroral oval here um, is, is just over, over Idaho. And so I am uh, sort of jealous of the aurora city, probably sitting around 90 in Boston. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so we have all this stuff coming into Earth's atmosphere. Um, I, I had someone tell me tonight that um, you know the plasma that's coming in, that making aurora, um, it does ionize Earth's atmosphere. And uh, someone told me that you can get a radio wave to bounce off of aurora. Um, and I just thought that was the coolest thing. I'm so glad that I learned that here tonight. <laughs> Um, I had thought that it was almost entirely, if not entirely, light that was doing that ionization. Um, it's certainly mostly light that creates um, plasma in your upper atmosphere. Uh, the visible light makes it all the way to the ground. The ultraviolet the X-ray light from the sun does not. Um, so you ionize the Earth's atmosphere with those energies on the day side, and that's why we don't have very good propagation on the night side. Of the E region or the D region of the atmosphere. The F region, F region ionosphere is a little bit different. So each of these layers in the ionosphere comes from a different sort of thing being ionized. In terms of light, it's ultraviolet in the F layer, X rays, um, molecular oxygen in the E layer, uh, you have F layer where we're ionizing atomic oxygen, and then this really deep layer that is only like 50 kilometers above our. So right now it's called the D layer, and it's, there's a lot of complicated chemistry down there. You can get negative ions, which are kind of exotic, and it's only the hard X-rays below 10 x so. Oh, and I forgot to say, there's two different colors of aurora, right? There's green and there's red. Red is high up, and green is lower down. They're both atomic oxygen. They're both uh, electrons coming into Earth's atmosphere. The reason that they're different in altitude is um, quantum mechanics. One has a radiative lifetime of minutes, and the other is about a second or two. So 
the green line at a second or two, if it doesn't collide with another atom in that second, it can radiate a green photon if you see it. If it were a red photon, it wouldn't radiate for a minute or two. And something is just going to bump into it and collision will be that oxygen atom. So that's why you get red at high altitudes and green at low altitudes. And why quantum mechanics is well, why quantum mechanics is that much is it that's messy. <laughs> So, yeah, so one of those ones. Um, so uh, the F layer sticks around uh, because the rate at which atomic ions recombine with electrons and neutralize themselves is really slow and inefficient. That's why we still can bounce off the F layer at the nighttime, but during the daytime, uh, you can get these other layers, E and D. Um, those don't last on the night side because the molecular ions recombine and become neutral and that'll no longer last for the waves. And I made it all the way from the core of the sun to, to, to the layers that we all care about. That was my goal. <laughs> thanks for thanks for being here today. We would like to uh, thank you so much for coming and speaking to us. We're, we're techie people. And then, um, actually, we're going to redo it a little bit. But we're going to take it back from you. This is my first time actually trying to do a QR code. So it's laser etched on the back and CNC engraved on the front, so you can use it as a name plaque or whatever you would like. This is really cool in the here at City. Keychain for you. Just for Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. I have to ask you one question. We have a, a member of both clubs who happens to be trying to listen into most of this in Indonesia and the Philippines right now. But his internet connection is very good, so he said the audio wasn't very good. Um, his question for you is, why is mercury always in a retrograde? It's not always. Uh, yeah. Retrograde is really hard to... So this is an astrology question. It's <laughs> <laughs> for you, Mike. <laughs> um, when, when one, yeah, so the planets don't, planets don't move like stars, right? They're wandering stars, and that's what got people started on that sort of thing. So they, did, they move with respect to the background. When one planet laps another, it appears to move backwards in the sky. We call that retrograde. Um, and Mercury is moving so fast, it has a lot of time moving backwards because it's often lap. So it's not always. <laughs> that was the question that he had to ask. Okay. Any other questions from people? So, so the question is a little bit on you. Um, there's this newspaper that you find in reference to him, and it's an issue of him being about his son. You know, I'm not going to do it. Very cool. <laughs> Oh, that's fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you have to do something that's fun. Otherwise, we won't be good at it, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, my job is really fun, and I'm very lucky and privileged to be able to do it. I recommend it if you get the chance. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> Very well made. Very well made. Yeah. Okay, I didn't get a picture yet, guys. He, he flew in today. Okay. Got here at like 5 o'clock today, for, and then came right over here basically for this presentation. How are we feeling? Mm -hmm. There you go. Do you have a website or anything that you can go to to see yeah, what you have to say? 
It, it doesn't say anything about the sun, but I have a website that has some planetary science stuff on it. Uh, I, I, I spent the 15 bucks a year to get the dot science domain name, so it's probably like <laughs> dot science. <laughs> Isn't it linked in the bio that we put online for the meeting? It is. We'll put it in. Thank you. Thanks so Thank much. you, everyone, for coming. This was really fun. Let's do it again. Okay? And again, I'm going to say, I know we as a club want to do stuff like this with the other clubs as often as we can. Yeah, Hi, Facebook. Down now, we are done. So we go to end.